I wanted to warmly thank Zahra for this opportunity to contribute to the lecture series. As some of you know already, I am neither an archeologist nor an art historian, but a philologist. It may therefore seem strange to you that I have something substantive to contribute to a time and place, Bronze Age Iran, which is very long in archeology span and art and very short on tax. What is worse, I am a specialist in ancient Mesopotamia and cannot actually read any of the relevant texts unless they happen to be in Akkadian, which fortunately for me, some of them are. To complete the ruins, I have only just started to work seriously on matters Iranian. However, my specialty is the study of religion, magic, and science, and the interface between them. In my quest, I regularly combine art, archaeology, and text, and have experience in tracing the lines of change and continuity that link iterations of what is essentially the same festival from Greece to Iran and from the third millennium BCE to the first millennium CE. Urbanization and reurbanization in what is now Iran were, as we know, fueled by the long distance trade networks that crisscrossed the region. Already in texts from the early dynastic period in Mesopotamia, we we're picking up campaigns into the Zagros, as well as into Elamite territory, by the rulers of the city states into which the floodplain was divided. There was Aanipad of Ur, who is reputed to have mounted an unsuccessful razia into Simurim and the Zagros. There was Enme Baragese of Kish, who is supposed to have, quote, carried off the weapons of Elam and also in Na'il of Kish, who styled himself one who smote Elam with weapons. These appear to have been little more than glorified raids, and the Elamites seem to have gotten their own back. A temple administrator from Girsu writes to his lord that he was able to beat off a rather sizable Elamite ruling the raiding party, killing 520 and recovering five silver mirrors, 20 mm -mm -mm, and five royal garments that they had run off with. At the end of the day, the Sumerians were down only 16 sheep that the Elamites had killed and eaten. But never fear, the fleeces of all these sheep had been safely recovered. Particularly active on the Elamite front was the city of Lagash Girsu, which had the advantage of being able to cross over to Elam by way of the marshlands and the ancient seashore. As when Aonatum attacked Pashime, quote, on the coast of the sea and kept going, ultimately defeating Susa and Urua, the Bolt of Elam thus gaining what Ianatum describes as a mountainous land of timber and treasure. And there was the trade, which brought in exotic woods by way of Dilman, or stones for the manufacture of mace beads in exchange for barley, readily transportable by water from Lagash and for Anatolian tin. One of the longer inscriptions of Ornanche of Lagash reveals that, besides the boundary dispute with Umma, there was also a sort of trade war that involved the seafaring merchants of Ur, in alliance with Umma against Lagash. Lagash was of course victorious or we would not be hearing about it with the man of Ur and the ruler of Umma and their various underlings captured and heaps of enemy dead piled up. But the prize captures were the man in charge of cargo boats of Ur and Umma's chief of the merchants, a gentleman who was shown among the royal children on one of Ornanche's plaques, presumably in his new job as chief of Lagash's merchants. Also of note is the temple of princely male donkeys that Entemena built for Lugal Uruba, an obscure divinity who had a palace at Lagash. The mention of pack donkeys suggests caravan trade. And it is interesting to note that Lugal Uruba's palace got regular daily offerings of precious metals and lapis lazuli alongside the more usual bulls and sheep. Parts at least of the material culture of the Bronze Age Iran have been recovered in excavation allowing for some speculative stabs at recovering social stratification. And we have what may plausibly be identified as palaces and temples. However, as far as religion is concerned, we have precious little more than the names of gods, some of which may plausibly, if not without controversy, attached to monuments such as Karanga. But who were these gods and goddesses? And what were the myths that brought them to life? Must we always fall back on royal ancestor cult and the Fraserian king as the font of fertility? Hopeless, you might say, but not so. We have an unappreciated ally in our search for meaning in the strange images carved on rocks and cylinder seals. Religious iconography is conservative, which means that the basic motifs that identify a particular divinity can allow us to trace that divinity well back in time and space to times and places where there are no tax. This can be tricky for a variety of reasons. It is rare for important divinities with large constituencies that transgress cultural boundaries 
to have only one way in which they can be made recognizable. To give a more modern example, we have on this slide a canvas shows a standing woman in flowing robes being crowned by two men, or rather the same man, represented twice, with a bird with rays coming out of his or their mouths between them. This woman is readily recognizable to her constituency as the Virgin Mary, being made Queen of Heaven by the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. On the next slide, we see a painting from the ceiling of a Georgian church that shows a male figure inside two back-to-back -back triangles and a seated woman in flowing robes next to an infant in a cradle that is connected to the male figure by a ray in the form of a chalice. This is readily recognizable to this woman's constituency as Mary, Mother of God, being shown with the Trinity. In principle, these two women are the same woman, um, and the male figures represent the same Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But the devil is in the details. The Catholic canvas insists on the identity and not similarity of father and son, the iota of difference that got Arians persecuted. But even more important is the filioque controversy that contributed to the Great Schism. The Catholic canvas insists that the Holy Ghost was issued jointly by the father and son, filioque, whereas the Orthodox painting is equally clear that the father issued the Holy Ghost to the son. Images by themselves can tell you a lot, as can text by themselves, but the full picture is only attainable when the two of them are put together. For the divinities of polytheistic non-salvation religions, we have a further complication, since, as we shall see, some divinities can take multiple forms even within a single constituency. This is particularly true of planetary divinities like Mesopotamian Ishtar, ignoring the fact that uh, some Ishtars are actually completely different goddesses. We know from Mari that Ishtar, Venus, had four manifestations corresponding to the four seasons of the year. Just to add insult to injury, at least one of them is essentially a different goddess, Anunitu, who was the fish of Pisces in her own right. So was she actually Ishtar? Uh, yes. Temple inventories of Ishtar's jewelry from Neo-Babylonian Uruk reveal that she had seasonal jewelry, among which is the wedding crown of Anunitu that made her queen of heaven. Perhaps for this reason, it is not unusual for planetary divinities like Marduk, who's Jupiter, Nergal, who's Mars, and Anurta, who's Mercury, to have variable genealogies. Taking Nergal as an example, he is usually attested as the son of Enlil or little Enlil, but he is also the son of Anu and of Ea, to the consternation of Cuneiformis. And there is one other factor that looks like a terrible complication, but can actually be a godsend. And that is that the gods of polytheism were not an exclusive club. So for example, the late Bronze Age Hittites were notorious for having a thousand gods. Many of them, as we can tell from liturgies that address them in their original languages of Akkadian, Horian, Luvian, Palaic, and Hattic origin. Even the Elamite divinities of Naprusha and Perinkir show up, the latter with a ritual of Haram. And then there was the problem of what was essentially the same divinity that was being worshiped in two different locations. We hear much of this problem already in the third millennium in the Sumerian composition and Merkar and the Lord of Arata. In principle, making replicas of a statue was possible. But there was something about that original image that made godnapping a thing. Running off with Marduk and other enemy gods is something for which Assyrians are notorious. However, uh, they always returned the originals when possible and simply added the divinity to the divine assembly. Not so the Elamites. When they took somebody, it was meant to be for good. And you had to fight to get your god back, as with Nebuchadnezzar I and Marduk. So far attested only from archaeology and in the third millennium, was the successful godnapping of the goddess Nanshe of Ningen, and the attempted godnapping of Ninhorsag of Tel Ubaid. In both cases, they took not only the statue, but the temple as well, literally dismantling it and lining up what they wanted to keep, the decorative friezes, for loading into boats to cross the marshes. They made away with Nanshe, whose cult in Mesopotamia seized forever at that point, then Horsag, however, survived since somebody stopped them in mid-theft. 
and the remains of her temple were found by modern excavators still lined up and ready to be taken away. The reason for this willingness to worship other people's gods is not far to seek. Gods in those days were for use, not for show. They controlled places in the landscape that a foreign conqueror trying to rule those areas had better not get angry with him. They were also extremely useful for just about anything anybody needed a bit of luck to do, like fighting a war or traveling in some way or, or succeeding in business or farming. As Elmer Burns used to say, farmers is the worst gamblers there is. The agricultural regime in the Near East, even today, features a hot, bone dry summer and a cold, wet winter. You can grow wheat and barley where the rainfall is adequate, but summer crops are impossible without irrigation. When we think of irrigation, we think of rivers, but that's never been the major source of water for summer as opposed to winter crops. Instead, viticulture is possible in the Fertile Crescent due to the presence of carcistic springs that underlay the Zagros, Taurus, and Amanus ranges, and that form a semicircle connected in the minds of ancient Mesopotamians with the freshwater ocean that underlies the Mediterranean and Persian Gulf into the terrestrial Apsu controlled by the god Enki, Ea. And viticulture is one of the invisible motors of the trade that brought more obvious natural resources of precious metals and colorful stones to places that did not have them. Grain does not transport well, except by water, not so wine, which also has the virtue of being not only transportable for long distances and wine skins on the backs of donkeys, but very responsive to local environmental conditions, producing three colors and an endless variety of flavors that gives even the places with no obvious natural resources something to try. The proper functioning of these springs, and I give you an example of an excavated one, um, the proper functioning of these springs and having them continue to flow was thus of paramount importance. And whoever first came up with the idea of a divinity, for obvious reasons netherworld associated, who could deliver that security, everybody else along the mountain chains was sure sooner or later to adopt. And adopt they did, as we shall see. Also a curious con concomitant of this nexus is the presence of two sun divinities one male and in the sky, and the other female and in the netherworld, as with Greek Artemis and Selene for the moon. So the Amanus has its Resheth and Shapshu, the Taurus its Eshtanu and Ilani, goddess of Arena, which means spring, and the Zagros had its Nahunti and Narundi. Objects do not grow legs and walk, or wings and fly. Somebody is transporting them. And these somebodies either go somewhere else to pick them up, or they come in themselves as merchants. Either way, you have cultural contact. Because high ticket items that are obviously what you are dealing with in long distance trade cannot simply be bought. You have to negotiate your price. And that requires time, and usually a bite to eat or drink and some conversation. Just for fun, let's imagine a Mesopotamian merchant arriving in the Zagros with some attractive room-sized rugs and warm woolen garments for sale, perhaps in this early period with a load of tin from Anatolia. And he and his customers have a communal meal while negotiating a price. And the question comes round to, well, who are you anyway? Where are you from? Girsu, who are your gods? Well, mainly Ningirsu and Ninhurisaganache. So what's this Ningirsu like? Where does he live and what does he do? He lives underneath the earth, but you can see him in the night sky, which is, you know, an extension of the netherworld. And he has a scepter with snakes on it and he brings victory in battle and is king of the gods and master of heaven and earth and passes judgment on mortals. Uh, yeah, we know him, but we call him something else. And anyway, who are Ninhursag and Nanshe? Ninhursag is his mother and Nanshe, his sister. Ninhursag is the spirit of the mountain ranges which is why she has trees coming out of her shoulders. And Nanshe is the spirit of the water in the mountain range that flows out and becomes rivers and runs to the ocean. Oh, and I should tell you that Yekibud, Yekinabud, the water was trapped in the mountain by a wall of rock. And Ningirsu had to fight a battle with this obstruction, whose name was Mr. Obstruction, Asag in our language, 
And he cut a hole in the rock for the river tigers to flow out of. Okay, we can accept that. And we know about the water spirit, although again, we call her something else. But what you say the name of the mountain spirit was? And what about Mr. Obstruction? Surely he was not eliminated completely. Otherwise the water would gush out and put everybody in flood all the time. You're right. Mr. Obstruction was given control of the rainfall and the waters in the mountain to keep in or let out at the appropriate times under the supervision of Nindirsu. Okay, we can accept that. Oh, and I forgot to tell you that this was before time began and that to allow the water to flow out of the mountain, Ningirsu had to fight those stones in the sky, you know, the stars, and make them move as he still does as one of the wild sheep, that's to say planets in the sky. Say what? Time, you know, yes, we know what time is. And you never wondered how it began? Well, no, but that's not the point. Forget the stars being chased around by wild sheep. Time will have begun with the first day. Really? Now listen, there must have been another sister, the future sun. You know that fire that comes out of the ground in our country? So you're saying that time began when Mr. Obstruction got defeated, allowing the sun to rise for the first time. Precisely. Okay, let's have it both ways. The sun came up and the water came out when Mr. Obstruction was defeated and then Ningirsu went and beat up on the stars. Oh, and Ningirsu had two sisters. It's a deal. Indeed, the Mesopotamian successor to Ningirsu, whose curious staff and characteristic months and the planet associated with them, even the Anzu bird he shares, namely the god Nergal, had the Elamite sun goddess of the netherworld Narundi as his sister. As luck would have it, I can roughly date the myth I've just outlined and which I have recovered from thief Ninorta who claimed Ningirsu's victories as his own. Ninorta's claim was based on a celestial event and that is the procession of the vernal equinox from its original position in the Mesopotamian month of Simanu into the preceding month of Ayaru. And by divine justice, Ninorta was treated to the same theft by the god Marduk when the position moved again into the month of Nisanu. Nisanu was the equinox of the second and first millennium, Ayaru of the fourth and third millennium, and Simanu of the sixth and fifth millennium BCE. And that is how old this myth is. And yes, Ninhursag was taken over whole in Iran to become Ninhursag of Susa. And our story does not end there. On the contrary, at some point, this merchant's tale reached the Punjab and produced an Indian version of our myth that is preserved in the hymns of the Rig Veda. To know um, is that there was a substantial early in-migration of Indo-Europeans that experts date to the third millennium BCE, and that has left traces in the textual record. Of interest to us here is the legend of Indra versus Virtra. It goes as follows. He slew the dragon. He traced the route of waters and split the breast of the mountains. He killed the mountain dragon. Tvastar made him a lightning bolt and the waters flowed out straight to the ocean. Indra, like a bull, drank three drafts of Soma and seized this jet black weapon. He killed the firstborn of dragons. When you killed the firstborn of dragons, you destroyed the magic of magicians, producing the sun, the sky, and the dawn. Indra killed Virtra, the most obstructive of all. We learn further that Indra killed this big coiled snake with a thunderbolt. He also killed his sons. The waters uh, were spouses of Dasa that Virtra kept locked up. And when Indra released them, they became the seven rivers of India. And then he, this is Indra, flew away as a bird to the wonderment of all. Was he afraid after his great victory? We have significantly shifted gears here. Our king of the gods, Indra, known here under the title of Shiva, of bull trident and drum fame, is the classic Indo-European weather god and mountain-born ruler of the clouds. Like Zeus, his weapon is the thunderbolt, Vajra, which unlike Zeus, he throws about to protect his herd of cows from domestic cattle wrestling. His careless milking of these cows is what produces the rain. The pressure of flowing water, re wearing down mountains and creating rivers and streams are attributed to Indra, work with his ax. Like Zeus, he had a taste for ladies he is not married to. As for example, the wife of his pet ape. One lady's husband cut him to pieces. And when they'd stitched him together, a <clears throat> key part was missing, which explains why that part is the corresponding part of a ram. He's also rather fond of Soma, as we saw, and is often drunk. That is the Indo-European part. 
But after that, we are firmly in the Tigris Zagros tradition, recontextualized for the Punjab with its seven rivers. The sun is produced by Indra's battle in the sky. And similarly, we see the first dawn and the beginning of time. We are also splitting rocks and creating rivers that flow to the sea. So our sky god takes out Asag, whose name Virtra is literally a translation of Asag and means Mr. Obstruction. Here imagined as an instructive snake demon who makes the water boil when he hits it. That done, Indra releases the waters that produce the rivers by cracking open the mountains, as in Ningirsu's Lugal A, where we meet lawless Asagasaku, who similarly makes fish boil when he hits the water. Not mentioned in either epic, but known from the Stele of the Vultures, is that Ningirsu had a bit of help when going to war for his city, and in this adventure, from Anzu. A winged leonine creature provided him as a mount by his mother, Ninhursa. As might be expected of such a creature, he has rather a mind of his own and has to be defeated six months later by Ningirsu and brought to book as described in yet another myth stolen by Ninurta. In the night sky, Anzu was visible as the constellation Pegasus, which sat after the Pleiades in Simanu and rose after the Pleiades in Kislimu. So at the fifth millennium vernal and autumnal equinoxes. After defeating Asag, Ningirsu was able to create the Tigris River by hacking a hole in Mr. Obstruction to let the waters out. However, in contrast to the Indian version, Mr. Obstruction is not killed, but instead, once he's been brought under control, is set up as a stone barrier to keep the rain in the sky, the celestial Apsu, as well as the water in the mountain, the terrestrial Apsu, so that you do not end up with floods and stinky marshes. And last but not least, to allow the male celestial sun god, Elamite Nahunti, to rise at the winter solstice over the Persian Gulf by pulling out the peg that traps him in Enki Ea's ocean of fresh water under the salt sea, about which more later. And then there is the enigmatic ending to the Indra myth. So why does Indra fly off after his great victory? Simplicity itself. What we are encountering here is Indra Vajrapani, but that is only one aspect of a god who is also Indra Varathragna, a direct translation of Nergal Dapini, known to us as the planet Mars. And the reason he has to fly off is that the planet in question had his nadir in Duzu the month immediately following his glorious victory. So this story traveled back across the trade routes to Iran and Mesopotamia, where it picked up a new wriggle about which more presently. Okay, so far we've been dealing with texts produced in Mesopotamia and India. So let me present you with some hard evidence from Iran. Very hard, in fact. Does a set of cylinder seals, the really beautiful one, is from a private collection published several times now, but of unknown provenience, except that it came from somewhere in Iran. Possibly, it has been argued, from the region of Tepe Yahya and Shahdad in the Halil River Basin of Kerman, and to be third millennium in date, specifically Akkadian. A good indication that some seriously long distance trade is involved, as indeed it would have to be for this Mesopotamian legend to have reached so deep into Iran, is the discovery of a comparatively crude representation of the same mythic event that was found in excavation at Gonur Tepe in Turkmenistan. With the beautiful one, we are in spring, and we have stumbled upon a wrestling match between two combatants. On the left is Virtra, Asag, shown as an athletic man with snakes coming out under his armpits, and two plants and horns of fire above. The opponent kneeling to the right is a bearded and helmeted Indra Vajrapani with a bow over his shoulder and a trident thunderbolt and a plant above. Behind him is his mother Ninhursag with horns on her head and a mountain hatch robe and holding a tree. She is seated on a recumbent Anzu shown as a winged leonine creature with a very long snake tail which provides a sort of seat for his mistress. In the center of the composition is the Zagros, with Kashuru trees growing out of its shoulders, above which rises the Elamite netherworld sun goddess, Narundi. We are again in the spring in the seal from Gonodepe and Turkmenistan. It's a much simplified representation of the scene we've been viewing. Ninhur Sag is no longer present. And indeed, although attested on third millennium seals from Iran, she does not seem to have ever made it to Central Asia. What we see here is instead the central sun with a seated figure in it, flanked on our right by what is quite clearly Indra Vajrapani in very schematic form with his jeweled helmet crown and his trident thunderbolts breaking out all over. 
To our left is Virtra with snakes rising in crescendo to his head a tree body, and a very nasty looking face. As I said, the motif of the divine battle that created time traveled to India and then came back. But how could the Indo-European sky god be reconciled with the netherworld ruler of heaven and earth? Key is the association with the planet Mars. We may remember that Indra Vajrapani had a biform Indra Veritragna. In this letter, God is well known in Iran of the Sasanian period as Bahram, which is the same word as Varathragna. The Bahram Yasht is unfortunately very fragmentary, but enough survives to make it clear this is one complex divinity. And it is also known from other sources that he is identical with Heracles Nergal, who you see here. Um, Heracles Nergal is recognizable as Nergal Dapinu. And sure enough, Bahram is associated with the planet Mars. But we're just a bit too early for this. What we need to know is if there's some third or second millennium ancestor, if you will, some god by a different name that was understood in Iran as the protector of the Karsistic springs on which summer crops depended, and yet also identical with Indra of Erythragna and Heracles Nergal. And yes, there is. In addition to our beautiful representation of the beginning of time in Indra Vajrapani, there is another unprovenient seal that is once again plausibly connected to Kerman and the Halil River Basin, Tepe Yahya, and Shahdad and dated at uh, this time to the early second millennium. We are not in the spring with the seal, but at the opposite end of the calendar in the fall, as may readily be seen by a number of iconographic elements. The raven Corvus is followed by a procession of seven women, three of whom are standing and four sitting. These are the Pleiades in the process of rising and taking their place in the sky, an event that occurs in the fall. Below you have a little man, naked except for a very prominent belt, pouring water out of a jar. And to notice is that the standing Pleiades also have streams of water coming out of their middles, probably from a water pot they are holding in their hands. Both of these represent the rain, which begins in that season. Behind the man with a jar is a seated female figure playing the harp, apparently to encourage the Pleiades to rise, and behind her yet another female figure sitting and holding a branch. Facing Corvus, who is apparently presenting the rest of the figures to him, is a divinity with snakes coming out of his shoulders, and seated above a grill throne base. That, I would argue, is a schematic representation of the Karsistic Springs of Iran and marks him as their ultimate master. The figure on the grill throne base is widely represented on Iranian cylinder seals and Elamite rock reliefs and may plausibly be identified as Napirisha Naprusha. This allows us to understand the lady with the harp as Kiririsha. As for the remaining figures, we may recognize the seated lady with the tree branch as Ninhursa, and the little gentleman with the pot as the tamed version of Asag, now regulator of rainfall, who appears quite frequently on chlorite vessels from Konar Sandal South, and also um, on a Mesopotamian cylinder seal from the early second millennium with Aya and being mastered by Nergal. This in turn allows us to identify Kiri Risha with Nanshe, Ninhursa's daughter, and Napirisha with Ningirsu, her son. Here, a married couple in the Indo-European tradition of divine brother-sister marriage, as with Zeus and Hera. Okay, there's Ningirsu, and there is uh, Napirisha and Kiririsha. But there's something odd going on here, and that is the curious treatment of Napirisha's head. Amie was clearly uh, baffled <laughs> by this, uh, but the photograph shows clearly what is up. Okay, so now concentrating on the head. The head on Apirisha's shoulder is that of Indra, complete with jeweled helmet. And over the top, shown behind, so as not to obscure Indra's helmet, is the skin of a lion, the Nemean lion of Greek legend. To know is that this legend, and indeed all the labors of Hercules, are what sense Greek speakers made of the religion of those who inhabited what is now Greece before they arrived a religion that linked Iran with the far end, maybe, of the trade networks that crisscrossed the Near East and adjacent regions at the time. So as revealed in this unassuming seal, Napirisha was already in the early second millennium, identical with Indra and Nergal, Dapinu, Heracles Nergal, and the ancestor of Bahram. Okay, but what about in Shushinak, that curious divinity whose name means Lord of Susa in Sumerian, but no less. How does he fit into all this? The answer is provided by a curious text in Akkadian found in a tomb in Susa that I have recently re-edited. It is a defixio of the nastiest sort, 
but has some interesting insights into the imagined Elamite netherworld. We are taken to the court of Napirisha, who appears here by name for the judgment of a case in which the practitioner is suing his enemy with the object of bringing about his death, <laughs> unless he does exactly what the practitioner wants him to do. His suit is successful and Napirisha develops, uh, de excuse me, delivers judgment, which is promptly carried out by his bailiffs, Ishmael, Harab, and Lagamal. A set of ceilings reconstructed by Holly Pittman depicts the scene of such a judgment. Accompanying the two bailiffs who are to drag the victim's body across the threshold of the tomb is none other than Shushinak. His job is to wait at the entrance to the netherworld and to pronounce the appropriate open sesame that will cause the gates to admit the miscreant. As depicted in this Elamite defixio, Shushinak is in a pit, like a peg, halfway in and halfway out. He also has a spring and a brazier with which to burn bad people up. Easily recognizable in this description is our friend Asad, the tame variety who guards the water and fire in the mountain, letting them out when ordered to by his master, Napirisha. His association with Susa as its tutelary divinity is rather obvious, since Susa is famous for its springs. Coming back to Mesopotamia, in the third millennium, there is a cylinder seal from Tel Lo, ancient Girsu, that depicts our myth of the beginning of time. On the right side, we see Ningirsu with his loins girded, hacking a hole in a tree-covered mountain to release his sister Nanje, shown on her knees begging Mr. Asag, with his torch raised to represent the fire in the mountain, to please let her out. On the left, with the ruler of Lagash Girsu presenting his regards, is a seated Ningirsu very carefully lifting the lid from Asag's brazier to allow Narundi, with long hair and uplifted hands, to rise as the sun. Mr. Asag's torch features in what was apparently a reenactment of his struggle with Ngirsu as part of a Mesopotamian ritual to avert the evil consequences of a solar eclipse occurring in springtime. Asaku shows up as himself and his opponent as the planet Mars, cloaked in a red garment and later to receive a pig, classic offering for Nergal, who, as we already mentioned, inherited Ngirsu's cult. At the height of the ritual, two sticks of red wood are lit at both ends and twirled back and forth to represent the battle. So a revised version of Mingyus's creation of time is what one would expect to flow back, at least as far as the Tigris. On the other hand, one would think that Indra as hero, even as an avatar of Mingyusu, would have found no takers. Not true, however. There were, as we now know, Horians, who had Indra as one of their gods, already present in the Trans-Tigridian region of Mesopotamia in Sumerian times in sufficient numbers to have produced several of the little kingdoms that were put together by Shamshiad of the first into Assyria. Moreover, there was locally a sort of equivalent divinity named Ishkur, Akkadian Ada, who threw about thunderbolts and like Shiva, had a drum to account for the thunderclap. In the north, he was responsible for rain, but his function further south where crops can only grow by irrigation, he was the canal inspector of the gods, or more precisely, the supervisor of spring floods the time when the rivers of Mesopotamian floodplain rise above their banks and have to be canalized in order to save the crops from being leveled. So very important, but absolutely nothing whatever to do with the netherworld, let alone the creation of time. Or so one might think. Lagash Girsu is notorious for its struggles with neighboring Oma over control of what was probably the original course of the river Tigris that flowed between them. The specifics involve a line of fields that Uma claimed as their own and their god Shara's territory, but which Lagash insisted belonged to Lagash and their god Ningirsu, and it was only leased to Uma in return for an annual payment. This arrangement had been set up by Masalim of Kish, who was the author, the arbiter of this particular quarrel, and there was a monument to prove it. It goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that dastardly Uma not only refused to pay, but persisted in destroying not only this monument, but all of the monuments that Lagash set up to stake claim to what they claimed and called the neck of the steppe, um, of whose fields by name Ayanatim gives a list, several of which Uma had the temerity to rename to celebrate their appropriation. Striking in this quarrel is the extent to which the gods of the respective territories are involved in the fray. We are apparently witnessing a full throttle conflict with our friend Ngirsu on the side of Lagash and Shara, who was essentially, as we shall see, the Umite iteration of Ishkor Adad, representing 
his city of Oma. According to Ayanatum, the god named Girsu was beside himself with fury at Oma's dastardly behavior, but he had a plan, and that was to engineer the creation of Ayanatum, the ruler of Lagash, whose destiny it was to do something about this. The rest of the pantheon of Lagash chipped in to help. Inanna did her job of ensuring a live birth and presented the newborn to Ningirsu's mother, Ninhursag, to nurse, being careful to put him on Ninhursag's special knee to receive the milk of her wholesome breast. What has led to wonder who was supposed to have gotten the other knee and the unwholesome breast? In any case, uh, Ningirsu was delighted and took baby Ayanatum's measurement using his own personal cubit, the distance between fingertips and elbow, and judging him worthy made him king of Lagash. Ayanatum knows all of this because the god Ningirsu came to him in a dream and gave him his mission and promised him a nice pile of Umayyad, Umayyad corpses and the ruler of Oma killed in his own city, preferably by his own citizens. This Steely of the Vultures, which we have already spoken, announces <clears throat> somewhat prematurely, as we shall see, the definitive victory for Lagash Girsu under the aegis of Ningirsu with the assistance of the Anzu creature contributed by his mother, Ninhursag. On the right side, we see Ayanatum of Lagash putting a spear in the eye of the ruler of Umma, while his troops in battle raid literally, literally trampled their opponents. We also see the construction of one of those heaps of bodies we keep hearing about in the text, being covered with earth by men on ladders. Meanwhile, on the other side, Ningirsu mounts his chariot plausibly reconstructed, um, it's in the drawn part, as you'll notice, as plausibly reconstructed as drawn by uh, Anzu with Ninhursag standing by, her hands folded in an at your service gesture. We know the name of the chariot in question, up of the or foreign lands of the god Ningirsu on the road to Eridu, the radiance of whose gum gum bird reaches into the heart of the foreign land. It even had its own temple shed at Lagash. Above the chariot scene, we once again see Ningirsu, entangling the hapless enemy in a giant net that has the Anzu bird on top, indicating that Ningirsu's mother, Ninhursag, has also supplied him with her net. So involved is the divinity in human quarrels that in the retelling of Entemena, Ningirsu gets the entire credit for the campaign in which the god was, Ayanatum says, acting as general for Enlil. In the event, Ayanatum did get his heaps of bodies, 20 of them in all. <clears throat> However, the ruler of Umma was not killed, let alone in his own city. Instead, Ayanatum, having reestablished Mesalim's boundary and its monument, makes the ruler of Umma swear to respect this boundary in future, and most importantly, to pay his rent, and then lets him go. And what an oath. We have the full text, which includes the accompanying ritual. It's involved separate ceremonies by which the dastardly ruler of Umma has to swear to honor the boundary while holding in his hands the nets of a whole host of gods, including that of Enlil, under whose aegis the violated boundary agreement was arranged, as well as those of Ningirsu's mother Ninhursag and his father Enki. <clears throat> Each divinity <coughs> is invited to catch the violator in his or her net, with the exception of Enki. She owned no net. Instead, her specialty was to make snakes come out of the ground and bite your feet. It is perhaps not surprising that this particular monument <laughs> was found in fragments. So, May we conclude that Lagash Girsu and Uma worship different gods who were literally each other's sworn enemies? Well, yes, they did, and no, they didn't. The gods of Uma were Shara, his father, Amit Anu, and his wife, Ninura, alongside Inanna of Zabalam and her husband, Ishtaran, serpentine god of Bear. The latter was particularly concerned with boundaries, as might have been expected, given the location of his city and a natural boundary between Mesopotamia and Elam, and he features prominently in Uma's quarrels with Lagash over the exact delimitation of territory between the two cities. To hear Uma tell the tale, his serpentine quali qualities made him the ideal enforcer to prevent a dastardly ruler of Lagash from tampering with Uma's boundary monuments. May poisonous fangs bite that ruler in his ruined palace. However, to hear Lagash tell the tale, this very same Ishtaran, directed Meselim of Kish when he drew the boundary that Lagash always respected and Uma persisted in violating. Shara is more or less equated with Ishkor Adad through his shared title of canal inspector of his father Anu. And as a warrior, he fights with a toothed arrow, that is to say a trident, 
So we may understand him as a sky mother god along the lines of Indra Vajrapani. And then things seem to get really strange. Sara is, Shara is strongly associated with Thonic gods like Lulal and Latarak, not the sort of company one expects from an Ada type Saiten, a sky god, and a dedication recorded on a gold plaque by a grand lady of Oma, uh, Bara Irdom, the wife of one king of Oma, daughter of another, granddaughter of a third, and daughter in law of a fourth king of Oma, indicates that Shara's netherworld connections were of a planetary sort. She made him shine, pa A from the pure dais she constructed for him in his august house. Shara's cultic personnel had some curious inclusions, notably Flaudis for Inanna's lover Dumuzi and snake charmers for her husband Itara Isharan. The latter was also to be found at Lagash, as for example, Bulal, the chief snake charmer, who was depicted among the royal children on a plaque of Or Nanshe. Moreover, Shara was a giver of judgment, as was Nin Girsu Nergal, and shared a temple in the Ur-3 period with the Anunnaki, the primordial gods of the netherworld who render judgment from under the earth. This was in a place called White Anzu, which was situated in one of the fields that marked that wretched boundary disputed between Uma and Lagash, in which the future founder of the Ur-3 dynasty took a personal interest, being somewhat of a devotee of Shara and therefore a partisan of Uma. In the Ninurta version of the Anzu epic, uh, also stolen from Nagirsu, Shara is portrayed as one who unsuccessfully tried to combat Big Bird. The naming of the toponym as White Anzu, however, more than suggests that from the point of view of Uma, Anzu was Shara's bird, defeated by him and turned into his ally. Most curiously of all, there was a Shara of Girsu as well as a Shara of Nippur. And there is more. Most royal inscriptions from this early period are exceedingly laconic. You have a king, he's great and wonderful, dedicated an object, built a temple for this or that divinity, period. Very occasionally, this is a divinity you've never heard of, like the Enkigal, attested only in the dedicatory inscription of a single ruler, or Luma of Uma, who the gentleman, a gentleman who ended up assassinated after invading Lagash's territory. But there are a few exceptions, and among them is the inscription of another ruler of Uma, who had the honor of uniting Sumer just in time to be taken out by Sargon of Akkad. We know him as Lugal Zagese, meaning king who established the boundary, a reference to the new country of his creation, which he ruled from the city of Uruk, and he left us with an inscription celebrating these events. One might expect in a royal inscription of this sort to hear of manly deeds, mighty battles, defeated enemies. And we know from other sources that Lugal Zagese literally wiped rival Lagash off the map, destroying even the temples of the gods in his destructive fury. We may safely presume that Lagash, who was not mentioned once in this inscription, had finally lost the disputed territory claimed by the dynasty of Zabalat Oma. Oma, game set and match. However, there's none of this here. The inscription, which is addressed to Enlil, Lord of the Lands, begins with his titulary, in which he presents all the major gods of the Sumerian pantheon as divine patrons of his considerably expanded rulership. But he has not forgotten his home city of Oma, and he informs us that he had the goddess Ninhursag as a wet nurse from her wholesome breast, no less. We notice that Ninhursag, whom we know of as Ningirsu's mother, has a surprisingly high profile, a bitter rival, Uma. The obvious suggestion is that Ninhursag is also Shara's mother, which explains what Shara is doing with a shrine in Girsu. And we have the gods of Uma nicely represented by Lugal Zagese, with one salient exception. The elephant in the room, the chief god of the Uma pantheon, namely Shara, whom one might suppose Luke Alzagesi would have the most to thank for his accomplishments. Instead, he returns to Enlil, referred to as king of the lands, who he says is responsible for giving him the kingship of Sumer, turning the eyes of Sumer to him and throwing all the lands at his feet, bringing everything into order from east to west and from the lower sea in the south via the Tigris and its Euphrates to the upper sea in the north. From east to west, Luke Alzagezi has nobody to oppose him. The foreign lands lie down in safe pasture and the land of Sumer rejoices under his rule. What is more, we hear that the prominent people of Sumer and the NCs of all the lands meeting at work separated him out for rulership. We are talking about what the Hittites called a pankush, an assembly qualified to confer leadership on a single individual. Not democracy exactly, but an election nonetheless. There was an ancient tradition in Sumer that has been dubbed the Kiengir League, in which the rulers of the various city-states came together 
to elect one of their number as their temporary leader to settle some dispute or organize against a common threat. There was an unsubtle difference with this iteration, and that was, as we shall see, that this arrangement was to be permanent, something along the lines of the Athenian Organized Delian League that became the Athenian Empire. In gratitude for all this, Lugal Zagese left the dedicatory inscription that we have been hearing from in Nippur for Enlil, with the promise of perpetual sendings of specified offerings, coupled with a very modest request for further favors. This take the form of a prayer delivered shoe tour, literally small hand, a reference to a gesture of offering depicted on early second millennium Elamite cylinder seals and ceilings from Susan Anshan. Palms are facing upward and the hand is partly closed into a sort of open fist, the ancestor of modern Doha. The modest request is for long life and an unalterable fate for himself. The fate in question was for the foreign lands to continue to live in safe pastures, the eternal shepherdship of subjects plentiful as the grass, not the stars, since we want the people to be only as large as the land can support, the rain coming at the right time, so that's the teats of heaven going aright, and people seeing a good land. In short, he wants the moon. And two things to notice. The favor is not to be granted by Enlil. Instead, he has to put it to his father, Anu. And what's the reward part? Um, which is meant to be shared between the two divinities, continuous sending performed work of bread offerings and pouring water as a libation. These are offerings to ghosts and primordial netherworld gods, such as the Anunnaki with whom Shara was associated. We may have moreover uh, remember there was a Shara of Nippur, Enlil is not just a divinity, but forms a part of a title, the Enlilship, that implies that the holder is king of the gods. And so the name Enlil can be and was applied to heads of pantheon that had nothing to do with Enlil of Nippur. So Marduk was the Babylonian Enlil and Asher the Assyrian one. This raises the possibility that Shara of Umat was being upgraded to the Enlilship, placing him in the position of ruler of heaven and earth for all of Sumer and not just for Umat. It would then appear that the Enlil to whom we are making our offerings is not Enlil of Nippur, but a translation of Shara reimagined as a new king of the gods. Anu is the father of Enlil is unproblematic, but so is Anu um, as father of Ishkar Adad, Shara's other Sumerian translation. All that is wanting for the Mesopotamian triad of An Anu, Enlil, and Enki Ea is the third part, which is presumably why we have a dedication at Oma to the otherwise mysterious Enki Gal, literally great Enki Aya. Since Napirisha's name is literally great God, we are probably safe in connecting him with Enki Gal um, and suggesting that Enki Gal was known as Ningirsu and Lagash. So at the end of the day, Oma and Lagash have a common pantheon with a major disagreement, more like the Catholic and Greek Orthodox arguments about Mary we mentioned above than rival gods fighting it out. The common, uh, commonality here was that there were two divinities, one more properly located in the sky, but with netherworld connections, and the other a netherworld god who was nonetheless active in the world. Where Lagash and Umma parted company was on the issue of which of them controlled Anzu and was ruler of heaven and the earth, and oh yes, who got to keep the disputed fields and to set the boundary between Ningirsu and Shara at the proper place. And there was Ninhur Sag, who was related to both of them, presumably their mother. Is it Shara of Umma who has imagined that Lagash is getting her unspecial knee and her unwholesome breast when she nursed them? So how did all this play out in the Zagros and beyond? The answer to this question is conveniently provided by one of the commentaries to the Mesopotamian, uh, first millennium Mesopotamian Sherpu rituals. This comments on a section of the text in which three Elamite gods are called upon to release a curse. Uh, Yabru, Humban, uh, Humban, the text, and Napirisha, Napirisha uh, in the text. Their equivalents are Anu for Yabru, Enlil for Humba, Humban, and Enki Ea for Napirisha, Napirisha. The three of them as a group represent the three heaven and earth shells that make up the time bound world. As such, they represent the future, Anu, the present, Enlil, and the past, Ea. We have already seen Enlil as giver of present boons and Anu of future ones in our Lugal Zagese inscription. 
Moreover, in a strict heaven and earth dichotomy, uh, these are actually spheres, not, not lines, but never mind, I can't draw. So, um, moreover, in a strict heaven and earth dichotomy, we may place Kumban Enlil on his throne in middle heaven, and Napirisha, great god Enki, in middle earth, with Anu in the outermost sphere. So, off the charts in an earlier generation. In terms of our Indian equivalencies, Kumban Enlil would then be the Indra Vajrapani and Napirisha Eya Indra Varathragna. Two separate gods who are nonetheless the same god. So this is Kumban and Napirisha, who are two separate gods, but nonetheless the same god. Quite appropriate for planetary divinity, Mars, in direct parallel to Inanna Ishtar, who as the planet Venus has at Mari four forms, two of which, Anunitu and Deritu, are separate divinities and nonetheless the same as she is. In Oma terms, Yabru is then Anu and the father of Kumban and Lel Shara, and also presumably of Napirisha, Napirisha, Great Aya, Ningirsu. The identification of Shara Ishkar Adad with Indra Vajrapani can readily be confirmed. Later in the second millennium, when the Horians created the Mitanni Empire, Ishkar Adad is Enlil, head of Pantheon, became Teshem or Indra Vajrapani to sort with Indra, um, parenthesis Varathragna, and uh, Napirisha, who received separate mention among the netherworld gods enforcing treaties in Hittite texts. How do we know this? More hard evidence. This Mitannian royal seal depicts Teshub, complete with thunderbolt weapon, mounted on a recumbent Anzu and taking on Asag Virtra, who takes the form of a wall of rock with a snake behind it. The Hittite Luvian equivalent of Indra Varathragna was Tarkunt, whose name means victorious, so literally Varathragna, and he appears in a first millennium rock relief from Ivriz as Tarkunt of the vineyard, wielding the grain and grapes, for the latter of which he provided the water in a nearby spring. Our friend, the Stila of the Vultures, allows us to connect this first millennium Tarkun to the vineyard more or less directly with third millennium Mingirsu of Lagash. The heap of Omai bodies already mentioned are depicted as being presented to Ningirsu, uh, misrestored on the, yes, Ningirsu, misrestored on the uh, drawing, as evidence of Iantum's zeal on his behalf. The god is further honored with a libation poured by a naked priest onto his symbols, grapevines heavy with grapes and sheaves of grain the products respectively of the waters under the earth and the waters in the heavens, both of them held in or released by Asag at the command of Ningirsu. The names of temples listed by Entaman of Lagash, in which he did work, are indicative of association of Ningirsu with a wine harvest festival. Quote, shrine in which pots are arranged, unquote. As we learned from Uru in Nimgina, this was a winery designed to hold great vats of wine from the mountains to go with the barley harvest in spring, Ningirsu also had a garden, or more precisely, a hunting park for gazelles, and uh, there was a brewery. But what about Napirisha, Napirisha, Great Enki, Ningirsu, as the son of Anu Yabru? This too has hard evidence to support it. We've already seen this a couple of times. Um, an Akkadian seal from Mari shows Anu seated atop the Netherworld Mountain with the Apsu running under it. This comes out to form a water boat in which a goddess readily recognizable as Nanshi Kiririsha by the standard that she carries. Behind her is her brother Ningirsu, shown as Aya, sparing an enchanted Apsu, as described in the Enema Elish. Completing the scene is their mother Ninhursag, who looks more like a man, but is recognizable as female by the curl of hair down her back and is Ninhursag by the tree growing out of her head. A little closer to home, an Akkadian cylinder seal from Tel Asmar, Eshnuna, appears to show Ningirsu Naprisha Eya having a birdfish man escorted to him by Usnu, his two faced vizier, and another minor divinity. Uh, this latter is probably Ningish Zida. Ningirsu Nergal's throne bearer and the patron of the vineyards, which Napirisha's waters are used to cultivate. I say Ningirsu Naprisha Eya because. His streams come out of his waist rather than his shoulders, and he is sitting on a grail throne. The scene appears frequently in quite a variety of iterations. On other Sagatid seals from Girsu and Ur, as well as Eshnunna, 
And to judge from textual references to Osaka going AWOL and attacking cattle in the form of a bird fish creature is probably meant to, re uh, to reference the spring. The fall is covered by further scenes that show feasting with wine and or plowing and a curious Etana motif appended. And last, by no lanes least, there are the summer and winter scenes when the planet Mars is his nadir and exultation. And sure enough, this is what is represented on the seals with the nadir strikingly represented within Girsu, identified by his plow seated on his Ashar Nitsirti, which is clearly an Apsu complete with swimming fish. All this would make Ningirsu Naprisha a sort of little Enki Aya with a little Apsu to match. Indeed, or Nanshe of Lagash included in his building program of temples for Ningirsu and Nanshe a quote, little Apsu, unquote. Little Aya was apparently a chip off the old block, since in one of his genealogies, Ningirsu had Enki Aya for a father. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some hard evidence that would allow for Aya to be Ningirsu's father and at the same time uh, Ningirsu of Lagash to be recognizable as the equivalent of Napirisha? And so there is another Akkadian cylinder seal that shows a scene from very early Sumerian hymn to Shamash. To make a very long story very short, what we're looking at is the mythical explanation for the observed phenomenon of the sun appearing to move each day after the autumnal equinox further south along the Zagros to rise above the Persian Gulf at the winter solstice. Ningirsu's role in these events will have been to ensure that the days do not go on getting longer by victory at the summer solstice and that the nights did not go on getting longer by rescue of Mr. Sun at the winter solstice. Ningirsu does this by going to where his father, Enkiaya, is holding the sun god prisoner and persuading him to let Asag pull up the plug and let the sun god return up along the mountain, the days getting longer as he goes. On the seal we are interested in, Enki Aya is in mid-battle, using the eagle of winter as a weapon, attacking the poor sun god each day as he digs his way out of the mountain with his saw. Whoop, I come up here. Am I safe? Nope, not down. Try again, next place. Um, while his sister Inanna looks hopelessly on. Ningirsu is shown at the summer solstice as represented by the lion. To notice is that besides the bow and the girded loins, he has a rather curious hairstyle under his horned helmet. The hair is braided. One braid falls to the front and the other to the back of his head, minus the Mesopotamian helmet on top that identifies him as Ningirsu. This is identical with the portrayal of Napirisha at Kurangan. In any case, with the salient exception of rival Lagash, it looked like the world was in for a nice time of peace and prosperity made possible my mutual understanding and fuel by trade. It was not to be. Lou Galzegese's uh, triumph was heartbreakingly short-lived, being brought to a cruel end by the upstart Sargon of Akade, who fancied himself a merciless world conqueror. Smash. To the east, Elam and Anshan beckoned to Sargon the Conqueror but there was a fly in the ointment in the form of a distant kingdom called Markashi that was in a position to dominate Susa and Anshan from the east. Markashi's rulers soon found themselves having to square off with Sargonid kings, at first unsuccessfully defending their interests in the Lama against Sargon and uh, Remush, and later uh, throwing a hand into the general revolt of the Sumerian cities against Narag Zin. Where was this Markashi? It has been cogently argued by Piotr Steinkeller that this kingdom is to be located in Kerman and the Halil River Basin. Of interest to us here is that there was a type of onion or garlic from Markashi that was imported into Sumer in large quantities. In texts from Lagash, we learn that Nanche, described as a holy mountain, appreciates being given a diorite mortar as a present. The uh, Anatom, Inanatom, the brother of the one who gave her the present, gives Nanche's brother Nigirsu another divine mortar made of diet, right? Specifying that it was for crushing garlic. Two gods lonely for the tastes of their other homeland? Other preferences of the same type are possibly indicated by a silver vase that was dedicated to Ningirsu to hold his monthly fat ration. Since we know that the silver for cult objects was brought down from the mountains. We are used to thinking of Mesopotamians as the civilized ones and the mountain tribes of the Zagros as the barbarians of the gate. However, in this case, the charges would appear to be almost reversed. The Sargonids can only be described as goons, whose philosophy was to burn down the house and rule the ashes. Not only were there heaps of bodies, 
but they boast about just how many people they killed, many of them in cold blood and after surrender. In the third millennium, the section of the Zagros that borders Mesopotamia was occupied by three tribal kingdoms, Lulubum, Gutium, and Simura. These could be reached from the Mediterranean floodplain via the baghdad Kermansha Road for Simura and Lulubum, or further south on the Deir Mehran Road, which gave access to Elam, and that's where Gutium was. Anaram Sin boasts of dealing out his usual death and destruction in the mountain lands, specifically Lulubum and Simurim. The famous Naram Sin stela was meant to celebrate his victory over Lulubum. And another less famous monument gives us the Lulubian perspective. A superficial similarity hides a basic difference. In the representation of the victories of mountain tribes, the enemy leader is being trampled. In the Sargonid representations, by contrast, the ruler is atop a heap of enemy bodies. In Lulubu, we meet our friend Inanna, or Nini, as Anubanini of Lulubu calls her in his rather minimalist Akkadian language inscription left at Sari Paul. As shown by the bare trees emerging from her shoulders, this Inanna was a mountain goddess, an impression confirmed by yet another Sumerian myth of Inanna and Mount Ebech, Jebel Hamrin, which he colonizes. Infuriated that this section of the Zagros that crosses the floodplain to Asher on the Tigris did not give her the respect she felt was due her, she causes a terrible forest fire, burning down the house to rule the ashes. Obviously a warrior goddess of the first water, she was the ideal patron of a group of mountain kingdoms that spent most of their time fighting one another. And Anubanini gives her due credit. She holds the nose rope of the conquered enemies who march past, bound with their hands behind their backs, as she tramples their leader underfoot. Similar representations are known for Idin Sin of Simora. Her characteristic iconography allows us to firmly identify this Inanna of the mountain as the winter aspect of Ishar Inanna, known at Mari as Deritu. She was, as her, name tells, as her name tells us, understood in greater Mesopotamia as the city goddess of Deir and spouse of its god Ishtaran. Her city lies just at the edge of the Zagros and guards the crossing at Mehran the main road taken by Elamites attacking Mesopotamia and Mesopotamians attacking Islam as well, obviously of trade routes leading into the Tigris region from Iran. It was from here that the Gudians swept down and conquered Mesopotamia, despite valiant efforts to head them off by merciless Mr. King of all Kings, Shar Kali Shari, who was to be the last king of all Sargonid kings. Until now, the Zagros kingdoms have spent most of their time fighting one another when they were not too busy raiding Mesopotamia but things were about to change. The Gudians, long a cipher, can now, Juris Serens argues, be recognized in archeological context by the gray flint bifacial willow projectile points that have been discovered at Ur and Lagash along with Eshnunna, Baruch, Kish and Adab, as well as Susa, but which have their point of origin, so to speak, rather further east in the greater Murghab Delta area of Turkmenistan which includes Gonur Tepe, where our less beautiful seal showing Indra versus Vitra was found. The points in question are imagined as being the weapons of mounted warriors wielding double convex bows, whom Zarin connects with the mysterious Nisku people mentioned in his yet unpublished Lagash II administrative text, and with a rather massive import of horses attested in these documents. A series of droughts and the gradual drying up of water sources, Zarin argues, drove Gudians from their homeland, and some of them came west, arriving in Mesopotamia at the end of the Sargonic period. Where I part company with him is the notion that Gudium is actually to be permanently located in Turkmenistan, and that the migration involved merely a brief passage through the Zagros. The kings of Gudium, whose inscriptions we have, are far too involved in politics in the mountains directly above Mesopotamia for that to be the case. However, uh, there is evidence for what were apparently roving bands of Gudians descending into Mesopotamia, where they found work in the army or made nuisances of themselves by cattle wrestling. And as things dried up back home, there will have been more and more hungry mouths for those settled in the Zagros to have to deal with. Viewing Sharkali Shari's train wreck of a rain from a safe distance, the Zagros hill tribes will plausibly have formed a coalition under Gudian leadership that allowed the Gudians, like the Seljuks after them, to divert the new arrivals down into the floodplain where they're known to have arrived in a body like water, quote unquote, or quote unquote, a horde of locusts. 
like Zugal Gates, the Gacy before him, the Gudian chieftain whose idea this was, will have imagined himself as a leader of a permanent coalition and confidently conquered himself a nice bit of Mesopotamian floodplain with the capital of Adat, strategically located in the border zone between the northern and southern halves of the alluvium. Who was king? Who was not king? Was the cry of Sumerians. But the real trouble was not just turbulence in Gudium with some 21 known kings. So even giving them a century that averages to five years per monarch, but that Lulubu and Simurim were not at all eager to be ruled by the Gudians on a permanent basis. Eridu Pizir, the first, maybe first Gudian king, has left us several inscriptions exclusively concerned with trouble in the mountains. Most of this trouble seems to have been from Simurim, who apparently found joy in stirring things up in revolts that extended as far as Lulubu. In the inscription of Gudian kings, we note the prominent mention of the god of Gudian alongside Ninhorsag and Nintu. It is very tempting to see in the god of Gudium the divinity Elamites called the great god, not Pirisha, or when writing in Akkadian, simply the god. To judge from their graves, the Gudians, who were buried en famille, in shaft graves that included over 70 persons of all ages and social groups, were exceedingly fond of gold. There were gold fillets, diadems, some with dot repousse, gold hair ribbons, gold hair locks, earrings, finger rings, and bracelets. In one of the graves was discovered a man's body, wearing no less than six gold fillets and overlapping sets um, with descending twisted gold ribbon, once wrapped around a lock of hair to show off his lunate earrings. There were also multi-stranded necklaces, heavy with imported carnelian and lapis beads, mixed with shell and delicately formed gold ones. Cosmetic sets and cockle shells or calcite vessels offered shades of white, black, yellow, and green. And for amusement, they were gaming boards with counters. And these people loved to drink. And the spouted vessel wine sets revealed just which beverage they preferred. Most curious were bitumen boats and the fact that sheep and goats were sacrificed at burial. All of this from the cemetery at Ur. But identical graves were found at Asher, as well as Kish and Ada with similar fillets from as far away as Gonera Tepe. So are we dealing with Turkmenistanis or Highland Elamites? I would argue the latter. And based on evidence that Zarin's leaves on the table, the hairlock briefly mentioned by Zarin's and described in detail by Woolley were pretty certainly used to manage the Highland Elamite braids we have already encountered on a seal from Girsu and that are depicted on a Sargonic vase adorning the head of a shackled prisoner, as well as an offering figure found at Tel Agrab. You can see there. What is more, the Sargonic graves from the Ur Cemetery, um, as well as from uh, Girsu and Eshnunna, are strikingly different from their early, the early dynastic counterpart. Both sets of seals show banquet scenes. But the ubiquitous Germanic beer has been replaced by French wine. Last but by no means least, these seals are replete with scenes that reference a uh, Naprusha, which we have already discussed. With the accession of Gudea, seventh ruler of the second dynasty of Lagash, a textual spotlight turns on to this otherwise dark period of Mesopotamian history. In texts from Lagash of this period, we hear a far flung trade reaching Syria on one side and India on the other. There are also rumblings of military activities, including a possible Elamite campaign, as well as prisoners of war from, guess who, Simorim and Lulubu. Taken together, this suggests a close relationship with the myriad Gudian kings who may plausibly be supposed to be his overlords. This would have put Gudea in a position of a tributary king, supplying tribute in the form of all that gold and silver from the proceeds of that long distance trade in which Lagash was by now an expert as well as providing troops for Gudian campaigns in the mountains from which he will have received a share of the booty. And there is more. It appears from a variety of sources, most notably currently unpublished Lagash to administrative text, that Lagash was controlling Ura in this period and that both of them were periodically visited by kings and their families, plausibly Gudian kings and queens whose table required the usual oxen and sheep but also seven different types of fish, along with ghee, honey, dates, cheese, apples, grapes, mutum, fruit, and figs. The fruits are mentioned in a text from Ur as offerings to Ningesh Sida. In addition, the king and queen are on record as receiving 
large numbers of gold and silver objects along with bugs in leather cases. From these descriptions, I can recognize with a fair bit of certainty, based on the research that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that we are looking at yet another iteration of what began as a celebration of Nan Sheh Lagash in the early dynastic period and found final form in Iran and Turkmenistan as the Sasanian festival of Mehragan. If so, the Gudian king will have supplied the royal wine and received in return the gold and silver, quote, gifts of Mikragan, unquote. In any case, all was quiet in Sumer until the advent of Puzur and Shushinak. He began his career as the Akkadian governor of Susa, but not for long. When we pick him up in his own inscriptions, he is king of Alamananshad and busy chipping away at Gudium on the far side. The object of the exercise was apparently to gain control of the Great Khorasan Road, an essential node in the network of trade routes, and a prize that later or three kings like Shulgi expended a great deal of effort getting under control, chewing up Simurim and Lulubim in the process. But he was just getting started. On to Eshnunna in the Diyala region, over to the Tigris at Mashkin Sharam, and down to Agade, which is far as he got. This was a golden opportunity for a king of Uruk named Utu Hengal to get rid of these mountain barbarians on the way to a bit of empire building of his own. And we have the propaganda campaign that made this possible, a sort of epic written by him about his Gudian campaign. Morally, he had no ground to stand upon. Since the first the Gudians heard of this campaign of his, it was a, the by ancient standards already illegal throwing of Gudian envoys into chains as he marched northwards to combat them. Undeterred, Utuhengal went about convincing his Sumerian audience that those Gudians had a snake with a scorpion tail for a chief divinity. More or less true, since Ayanatum of Lagash once referred to Ningirsu as a dragon, and that the Gudians raised their hands against the gods and carried off the kingship of Sumer to the mountain land. That's not true. Last I looked, their capital, Adam, was on the Mesopotamian floodplain, as indeed were their dead buried in communal graves at Ur, Kish, Adab, Nippur, and Asur. And what was that Gudian translator doing at Adab? But I digress. Oh yes, the Gudians filled Sumer with wickedness, took away the wife from the one who had a wife and the child from the one who had a child. Uh, and um, did I say they put wickedness and evil in the land? Our hero was certainly long on polemic and more than a little short on evidence of actual Gudian malfeasance. Key to his success, was cracking off the Gudeans' natural enemies in the mountains. And in this enterprise, he had one advantage, and that was the more or less common pantheon created by the cultural interaction that connected the ancient Near East with Greece and India. So Utu Hengal did some serious bowing down before he ventured to engage the Gudeans in battle. His enemy was the Tyrigon of 40 days, who appears as the 21st and final king of the Gudeans who ruled Sumer according to the Sumerian king list. I'm hardly the first to connect the name with the month of Tiragon and the common practice of naming children after the month they were born, if it's significant. So for example, Ramadan is suggestive. If we may take this at face value, then the Gudians, the Lubians, and Sumerians were, as we might have expected, on grounds of simple geography alone, fully the loop of the gods we have been hearing about. As for the Gudians themselves, if they are indeed from Turkmenistan. Um, yes, so this would be the, the festival of Tirigan that he would have been named after. Um, if we would take this at face value, everybody, as for the Gudians themselves, if they are indeed ultimately from Turkmenistan, remember that one of the seals depicting the beginning of time was from Gonur Tepe. And then there were those Ningirsu Naprishu Aya seals found in the Royal Cemetery at Ur. And last but not least, there's the apparent celebration of Mehragan during the rulership of Gudea. Of this common pantheon, I would argue Utu Hengal took full advantage. He was, as we would say, waging an aggressive war, which he was desperate to present as a just judgment of immortal gods. And he covered all bases with a decidedly peculiar, from a Mesopotamian standpoint, set of references that specifically targeted members of the common pantheon. Utu Hengal begins by restoring the boundary of Lagash for Ningirsu, Na Perisha, and Nanche Kiririsha, symbolic of alleged violation of boundaries by the Gudians. He gets a formal judgment from Enlil of Nippur, 
which allows him the use of inanna, nini or deritu, described rather incongruously as the lioness of battle who butts foreign lands. Okay. Normally, Enlil would be sending Ninorta for such a task, but the Lady of the Mountains was what was required here. Allegedly, the Gudians had trampled everything and taken control of both banks of the Tigris. They blocked the water from the fields, closed off the roads so they were overgrown with grass. Curiously, nobody but Utu Hengal had managed to notice all this, but the citizens of Uruk are soon informed. And they and the citizens of Kolab are persuaded to join Utu Hengal at the Temple of Ishkor Adad in a body once they have been informed of Enlil's moral support and that Inanna has been recruited as an ally. Utu Hengal also gets a volunteer from Dumuzi Ama Ushumgal Ana, whom Gilgamesh sends as his bailiff. Gilgamesh was a judge of the netherworld, but also the constellation Orion, from whose belt Sirius appears to originate as if shot from a bow to flash across the summer sky, summer and winter sky, I should say. Uh, this star is what is known in Iran as Sras, a dog, a rooster, but also an arrow, the arrow, tear of Tyrigan. So a divine judgment of particular personal relevance to the Gudian king. Last, by no means least, Uto Hengal stages his campaign from the sanctuary of Ishkor Adad, that's Nachumban, and he gives prayers to both Ishkor and to Utu, this is Nachunte, asking for their help on Enlil Sesa. The capture of the envoys ensured secrecy, as did getting up in the middle of the night to bring himself upstream from capital Adab by daybreak. The unsuspecting Gudians soon fell into the trap and Tyragon is forced to flee on foot and alone for the city of Dabram. It was not to prove a safe haven. It was not long before the city of Dabram felt it prudent to imprison Tyragon and his wife and children, realizing, says Utu Hengal, that the god of Enlil has granted him power. The bird once in hand, Utu Hengal performs a gesture any local would immediately understand. He makes the captured king of Gudium lie down before Utu and places his foot on his neck thus performing the ceremony that you see in Zagros inscriptions with Inanna Nini giving the victory to the king of whichever of these little states that fought each other all the time had this time won out. It was perfect. In conclusion, we are conditioned to think of warfare as inevitably in the style of the Sargonids with one party getting their God say so to kill other people and take their stuff before moving on to the next victim. However, it does not have to be so. And the cultural contact produced by fair and non-exploitative trading and a brothering rather than othering of other people's customs and religions has the potential to bring a bit of peace and quiet to a war-torn world. Thank you.